Good afternoon. It is with deepest gratitude that I am here today and that I stand here today with my survivor sisters. Gratitude that justice has been done. Gratitude for the incredible effort and skill and integrity that was poured out by Lieutenant Andrea Mumford, Assistant Attorney General Angela Povolitis, and Chief Dunlap. Gratitude for a judge who presided with true justice over our case, and gratitude most particularly for the incredible army of survivors who rose up in the last two weeks to stop the reign of a predator and to ensure a tragedy like this never happens again. But as you have heard this week, Larry Nasser did not arise in isolation. Rather, we saw the worst sexual assault scandal in history unfold because a predator was left in power for decades. Despite warning signs, despite red flags, despite direct reports of assault. While these women and I were in court today stopping our abuser, MSU and USAG were also in court, but they were not in court standing with us. They were in court asking a judge to dismiss all claims of liability against them. USAG claimed in part that they owed no duty to warn any of their gymnasts about Larry's predatory behavior. MSU claimed in part that all the warnings you heard these survivors testify to, that they gave MSU employees and officials over 20 years, did not count as notice, even the ones given to psychologists who are mandatory reporters, because the teenagers allegedly didn't report to the right person. According to MSU, it doesn't count unless you report to the person who can fire the alleged perpetrator completely contradicting the statement that Luanna K. Simon sent out in 2012 telling her entire 11,000 staff, member staff, that everyone was required under policy to report reports of sexual assault or to report the abuse of a child. So which is it? We have waited 18 months to hear MSU respond to our concerns and to say no, this is not how we treat sexual assault victims at MSU. But instead, they have played word games, insisting that no one at MSU knew of the abuse because no one believed it was abuse, completely failing to recognize that the abhorrent failure to act properly on all the reports they received led them, led them to not believe. No one believed because no one listened, and they are still not listening. Since it appears that once again this very morning, MSU has not been listening, I want to make the questions they need to answer blatantly clear. MSU and Board of Trustees, when Kathy Collegius waived a report form in front of Larissa and said she could report, but there would be consequences, was that an acceptable way to handle a report of sexual assault? At the time Kathy decided not to report Larissa's story of abuse, did she violate MSU's policy on reporting? Or was there no policy in place to protect the children? Because either way, we have a problem. When Destiny Teachner Hawk refused to listen to Tiffany Thomas Lopez and made sure she knew how difficult it would be and how much difficulty it would cause both Larry and Tiffany if she reported, and when she wielded the emotional pain Tiffany was in after losing her father like a weapon, was that an acceptable way to handle a disclosure of sexual assault? When Destiny failed to report these allegations to the proper authorities and up the chain of command, did she violate MSU policy? Or was there no policy in place to protect the athletes and the students and the children on MSU's campus? Either way, we have a problem. When William Stolak, an MSU psychologist, failed to report the abuse of Kyle Stevens and instead brought Larry into the room to deny the allegations to her parents, was this an acceptable way to handle a report of sexual assault on MSU's campus? And this week, in testimony, we learned that two MSU rowers had disclosed Larry's conduct to two different MSU psychologists who also did not report. So this is my other question. Who else at MSU 
had received reports of Larry's behavior and did not act. Who else helped contribute to the greatest sexual assault scandal in history? And as you have listened over the last two weeks to the accounts of devastating pain that I and our, my survivor sisters have been through and the long-term damage that they now carry, as we have been in court making these statements to stop our abuser, MSU Vice Chair Joel Ferguson has been making statements too. As if calling us ambulance chasers who are looking for a payday wasn't derogatory enough. While we were in court stopping the worst predator in U.S. history, Ferguson said there was a lot more happening than, quote, just this Nasser thing. As if the worst sexual assault scandal in history perpetrated on primarily little girls was just a blip on the radar. He stated that other good things at MSU have to be considered too, like the incredible new basketball stadium. It's nice to know that over 200 sexual assault victims rank below a basketball stadium. He emphasized that the big donors still support MSU, once again proving that money matters more than the bodies and souls of little girls and women. He laughed at the idea, laughed, at the idea that the NCAA would investigate because, well, quote, we weren't football players. It appears 200 little girls and women rank very low at MSU, not important enough to even consider an investigation into how many children could be sacrificed for so long. He expressed his belief that a change in leadership would result in, quote, too much collateral damage. Vice President Ferguson was notably absent from the courtroom to see the damage that was unleashed when Larry Nasser was allowed to prey on children for 20 years after the first reports of sexual assault. The fact that the vice chair of the MSU board could be characterizing sexual assault victims in such derogatory and shameful terms without being soundly and immediately condemned for both his words and his actions is truly appalling. But Vice Chair Ferguson has been saying these sorts of things about all of us survivors for almost a year, unabated, unchallenged, and unchecked. It can lead to no other conclusion than that the rest of the Board of Trustees agrees with his words, and that this really is how sexual assault survivors are treated on MSU's campus. If it is not so, then let them say it. And so now, ladies and gentlemen of the press, it is your turn. We survivors have taken our stand. We have demonstrated the desperate need for change at MSU, USAG, and organizations like Twistars. But in order to make that change, we must identify each and every breakdown that occurred, which allowed Larry to prey on women and children for so long. I have no doubt that you, in your early, early journalism classes, like I in my early communications classes, learned the same basic investigative techniques, the five W's and an H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. The who, the what, the when, and the where was answered this week as my survivor sisters and I took the stand. But the why and the how has yet to be uncovered. Why could Nasser get away with sexually abusing little girls for so very long? How could two major institutions surrounding him so abhorrently fail at protecting the children and women under their care? This is the worst sports scandal and sexual assault scandal in history. It involved not one, not two, but not, and not even three, but four major institutions in our state, MSU, USAG, a national organization, Twistars, and the USOC, who all could have stopped him at some point who all have not taken action against the people that enabled Larry to abuse? Should we not work endlessly for answers so that we know what to do differently the next time? I am grateful to be standing here with this army of survivors passionate for change. And today was only the beginning. Thank you.